helpful to the organizers of this conference, um, Professor Adimurti and Professor Dave for giving me a chance to be a part of this August gathering. And after such an impressive, vigorous talk by Professor Mukanda, uh, um, my talk is almost all of it is history, uh, origin and development of valuation theory with a special view uh, of the role of immunoider in the development of this subject. Uh, evaluations have been around in mathematics since ancient times, uh, since uh, uh, um, when Euclid had proved the uniqueness of prime decomposition of natural numbers about 300 years before Christ, then this result permitted him to code the natural numbers by the exponents with which the various primes uh, P divide these numbers. These exponents which occur in the factorization of a natural number, in fact, uh, represent periodic valuations used in number theory. However, valuation theory as a separate and systematic mathematical research based on a set of axioms started in the 20th century in the year 1912 when the Hungarian mathematician Joseph Kuship uh, um, uh, announced at the International Congress of Mathematicians held in Cambridge the first abstract structure theorem on valued fields. Uh, the paper uh, itself written in German appeared one year later in Kareli's journal. Uh, at the uh, outset of the paper, we have the four, four uh, axioms uh, uh, for evaluation. Um, a mapping phi from a field K into real numbers is called evaluation of a field K if it satisfies the following four axioms. Phi of A is zero, greater than zero, if A is non-zero and phi of zero is zero, phi of A plus B is less than equal to phi A plus phi B, phi of A B equal to phi of A, phi of B, and there is an element A belonging to K for which phi A is neither zero nor one. Uh, Kushak named, uh, Kushak paper was written in German and Kushak named, uh, uh, used the name Bewerton which is translated into English as evaluation. Uh, the notion, of evaluation is a generalization of the usual notion of an absolute value of the field of complex, defined on the field of complex numbers. So these valuations in modern terminology are called absolute values. So in, for the rest of the lecture, I will use the word absolute value. The, the term valuation is now reserved for a function closely associated with absolute value. I will define that later. The pair K phi is called a valued field. So example, the first example, periodic absolute value. Let P be a prime number and fix any real number C lying between 0 and 1. Uh, for any non-zero integer A, we can write A as, we can take out the highest power of P outside and write A as P to the power R times A dash, where R is non-negative and P does not divide A dash and define uh, the, the periodic absolute value phi p of a to be equal to c to the power r, one can easily check that phi p of a b equal to phi p of a, phi p of b, and phi p of a plus b is less than equal to maximum phi p of a and phi p of b. And uh, of course, phi p when extended to the quotient field q of z also satisfies the same properties and the extension of phi p to rational numbers is called the periodic absolute value of q. Uh, yes. Uh, phi p of a equal, uh, we fix any real number c lying between 0 and 1. Okay. Uh -huh. Huh. Power of P dividing A. Uh, yes, it, it can have. Uh, uh, yes, yes. First. And uh, later on, I will tell you that C doesn't matter. If you pick one C, another person picks another C naught, and they give rise to something called equivalent absolute values. Okay, so so as far as topology is concerned, it doesn't matter which C you pick up as long as C lies between zero and one. 
Ha! Ah, that is a standard way. That is a standard, standard, something called standard something. Okay. So, as to the choice of his axioms 1 to 4, uh, uh, Kushak refers to Hansel's article of 1907, where Hansel, uh, in the case of periodic numbers, had already defined some similar uh, uh, valuation function. I, I'm going to define what are periodic numbers. We don't deal with them, okay, uh, for the moment. The properties of that function were used by Kushak as his axioms. So although the formal definition of evaluation was given by Kushak, in 1912, the ideas which governed valuation theory in its first phase all came from Hansel. So it was Kurshak who formalized the thing. Um, so Hansel may be called the father of valuation theory. In fact, grandfather, because he never cared for the, uh, uh, never cared for the general theory. He only, uh, uh, came, he only had periodic uh, absolute values in mind. Uh, before Kushak, Hansel had defined periodic numbers through their power series expansion with respect to a prime element. This procedure was quite unusual since Hansel power series do not converge in the usual sense and they do not represent numbers, that is they don't represent complex numbers in the sense understood at that time. Um, Kushak's paper was written to give a solid foundation for periodic numbers in a similar way as Cantor had given for real numbers. So, uh, so li like we construct Cauchy sequences of rationals and they form a ring and Cantor had given construction for, for uh, real numbers. Thus we see that the main motivation to introduce valuation theory came from algebraic number theory while the model for axioms and the method of reasoning was taken from analysis. So valuation theory forms a solid link between algebra, number theory, and analysis. So Kushak's main theorem, uh, every valued field K phi means phi is, a, uh, phi is an absolute value of a field K, defined on a field K, admits a valued field extension CK psi. CK is a field containing K, K is a subfield of CK, and the mapping psi extends the mapping phi, so that's an extension. And CK is algebraically closed and complete with respect to the metric given by distance between x and y equal to psi of x minus y for any x y belonging to CK. So when Kushak published his valuation theory paper in 1913, he was 48. This is the only paper of Kushak on valuation theory. He held a position at the Technical University in Budapest. And and uh, uh, and his list of publications comprises about 80 papers between the years 1887 to 1932 on a wide variety of subjects. Uh, um, after Kushuk had uh, Kushuk had started a theory of valued fields, it was Alexander Ostrowski who took over and he developed it further. Ostrowski was born in Ukraine and he had come to the place of Hansel Marburg in 1911 at the age of 18 in order to study with Hansel. A. Frankel, who was in Marburg at that time, he recalls in his memoirs that Ostrowski showed unusual talent and originality. And I do I can't read I need uh, I can't read with perfection in German. So this is the actual words written by Frankel. Uh, in Marmur paper, in Marmur, the home of periodics, uh, where Hansel uh, was placed, Kushak's paper was uh, uh, thoroughly studied and discussed. And when, at the age of 20, when he, in 1913, he, uh, Ostrowski wrote his first paper, in which he answered one of the questions which Kushak had posed, and he could not answer. And that question was, is it true that the algebraic closure of a complete field is complete again? Complete valued field, complete field with respect to an absolute value. Is it complete again? And he answered that it is complete 
a separable extension or it is complete if and a separable extension of a complete field is complete if and only if it is finite. So the algebraic closure of a complete field is complete if and only if it is a finite extension. And later on, Artin and Schreier found characterize all fields whose algebraic closure is a finite extension. We will talk about it later. So in in eight nineteen. Uh, in uh, uh, 1908, rather one in 1917, another in 1908, Ostrowski proved two fundamental theorems in the first theorem, all possible absolute values of the rational number field Q were determined. Uh, uh, Ostrowski proved that up to equivalence, uh, I'm going to define equivalence. There are, these are precisely the usual absolute value and the periodic absolute value phi p for all primes p. I give an example. So, so the, the, up to equivalence, uh, there are only two kinds of uh, absolute values for the field of algebraic, uh, for the field of rational numbers. They are uh, uh, usual absolute value and the phi p for v is prime p. Two absolute values phi 1 and phi 2 of a phi and phi 1 of a field k are said to be equivalent if one is a power of the other. Of course, if you take any power, if phi, if phi is a absolute value, phi a to the power r and any positive r won't be an absolute value. It will always be an absolute value when r lies between 0 and uh, 0 is less than r is less than or equal to 1. So and it will always be an absolute value for all positive real numbers r if and only we have a special kind of uh, absolute value. They are called non-archimedean or ultrametric absolute values. They satisfy the same property as Periodic absolute value was satisfying phi of a plus b is less than equal to maximum of phi a and phi b. So uh, an equivalence class of absolute values, uh, an equivalence class of absolute values is called a prime of the field, uh, usually denoted by a symbol like curly p and the corresponding completion because every every absolute value gives rise to a metric on a field and so we can have we can talk about the completion with respect to meet this metric and it will be noted by a symbol like k sub p uh, um, uh, so a Swarovski result can be uh, uh, above result can be re-expressed by saying that every prime curly p of the rational number field q either corresponds to a prime number p or it is Curly p equal to curly p infinity is the prime containing the ordinary absolute value. So it may be worthwhile to point out that Ostrowski was the one who defined, who introduced the notion of a prime in an abstract field. The classification of absolute values into Archimedean and non-Archimedean uh, 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 absolute value was given by Ostrowski in 1917. And absolute value phi is said to be non-Archimedean if it satisfies the ultrametric inequality. Phi of A plus B is less than the maximum of phi of A, phi of B. If K and L are fields with absolute values phi and psi, then K phi is said to be a isomorphic to L psi. If there is a field isomorphism, uh, f from k onto l preserving absolute values. So uh, 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 Ostrowski's first result, uh, which he proved uh, uh, in 1917, um, um, was published in 1918. Uh, it says, uh, let k be a field complete with respect to an Archimedean absolute value phi. Then k as a value field is either isomorphic to reals or or to complex numbers uh, uh, with respect uh, up to equivalence or up to topological isomorphism. K is either reals or it is complexes. Uh, Imi Neuther's interest in Ostrowski's work. One of the first readers of uh, Ostrowski's paper, which I just mentioned, was Imi Neuther. In a postcard written to Ostrowski, Ostrowski sent him uh, his work in 1916. Ostrowski had proved the result. So he sent to, in a postcard written to Ostrowski in 1916, she writes, uh, I, I cannot read the uh, this version, but uh, uh, I have, uh, quote, I have started to read your functional equation and I'm very interested in it. Is it perhaps possible to characterize the most general field which is isomorphic to a part of the field of 
real numbers. Uh, the title of Ossowski's paper uh, was uh, uh, on some solutions of functional equation phi x phi y equal to phi x y over Eine Lozungen der Functionalizung phi x phi y equal to phi x y. So, so Eminoider does not only express the interest in Austri's work, but immediately poses the right question, which field can be isomorphically embedded into R. Her question was answered later in 1927 by Art and Shire theory of formally real fields. I'll come back to the answer. The, uh, this postcard has been cited in order to put into evidence that Eminoider has shown interest in the development of valuation theory right from the beginning. Later in 1930-31, she actively participated together with Richard Broad and Helmut Hasse in the proof of the well-known local global principle. I'll come to it later. So, 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 uh, I'll come to it later in, in detail. What is the theorem she proved in 1934? Uh, Ostrowski wrote a paper of 136 pages, adding several significant results to valuation theory. In this paper, he introduced something called Hanselian valued fields, some a valued field in which Hansel's lemma holds. Now, what is Hansel's lemma? That will be the, on the next slide. So he studied the properties of these fields and proved that any algebraic extension L of Hanselian valued field is again Hanselian. Uh, 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 of course, he proved many more results. I will not talk about those uh, things. A simple looking result proved in this paper is the description of all absolute values of algebraic number fields. Algebraic number field is a field which is a finite extension of the field of rational numbers. So first of all, he, uh, he found uh, all the absolute values of Q, and later in 1934, all absolute values of any finite extension of Q. And that is the following absolute values of the field. Uh, let K be an algebraic number field, and let OK be the ring of algebraic integers of K, means that subring of K, all whose elements satisfy a monic irreducible polynomial with coefficients from integers. Number one, an Archimedean absolute value of k, any Archimedean absolute value of k, which is uh, is equivalent to the absolute value given by alpha goes to mod of sigma of alpha, where sigma is an embedding of, where sigma is an isomorphism of k into complex numbers. Now, what, about, what are the non-Archimedean absolute values? If phi is a non-Archimedean absolute value of k, then there is a non-zero prime ideal p of OK. For rationals, we had an ordinary prime number. And for, for, oh, for, for the ring of integers, OK, for OK, we have a non-zero prime ideal p of k, and a positive real number c lying between 0 and 1, such that phi of alpha equal to c raised by nu of alpha. <laughs> there, I remember, it was nu of nu of uh, uh, the highest power of p dividing alpha, and here nu alpha stands for the highest power of the prime ideal curly p occurring in the factorization of the principal ideal alpha. Okay, two absolute values defined by different prime ideals are non-equivalent, and two absolute values defined by different embeddings of k can be equivalent, but only when these embeddings are complex com conjugates. Of course, because one embedding alpha goes to sigma of alpha, another is alpha goes to sigma alpha conjugate. So these are, they are equivalent only in that sense. Next. Uh, so I, I promised uh, uh, something, uh, there's a large class of, there's a, yes, a, yes, I think. Yes, yes, it was, it was, it was uh, uh, Immunoider. Uh, uh, you asked me the right question. It was Immunoider who uh, uh, introduced a, a special class of rings called now, which we now call Dedekind rings, which we now call. She she named them as Fumf, uh, Fumf, what? Uh, five axioms, five axiom ring A, means five axiom rings. So, uh, so, uh, uh, so these are the kind of, these are the rings in which every non-zero ideal can be uniquely written as a product of prime ideals. 
every non-zero ideal can be unique. One of the characterizations is this. Of course, there are other characterizations. There are more than a dozen characterizations known of Dedekind uh, domains. So, so, so that is it. Uh, uh, between the years 1918 to 1924, actually in 1919 19 only Czech mathematician Karl Rischlich wrote, uh, 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 wrote a paper uh, in which uh, he elaborated on Hensel's ideas uh, uh, for a complete field. Uh, uh, he gave a simple proof for the prolongation of any non archimedean absolute value to an algebraic extension that is given a non archimedean absolute value how to extend it to a to a uh, uh, to a finite extension of particular interest to us is his paper which he again wrote in uh, uh, German in 1923, same paper, uh, Richly wrote, uh, which appeared in Kerele's Journal and which contains a proof of what is called Hansel Richly lemma. He extended on the ideas of uh, Hansel. Hansel had already proved that lemma in his 1908 paper. So, uh, so, uh, uh, so when he introduced periodic numbers. So, so for that I need a definition. Let phi be a non-archimedean absolute value of a field K. The set R which consists of all those elements A belonging to K such that phi of A is less than equal to 1 is a subring of K because phi of A plus B, A plus B will be there because phi of A plus B is less than equal to maximum phi A and phi B and then a B will also be there is called the value is called the valuation ring of phi. The set M, which consists of all those A belonging to R such that phi of A is less than one, is an ideal of R, which consists of all non-units of R. So it will be unique maximal ideal of R. And this is a maximal ideal of R. The field R mod M is called the residue field of phi. And the example, the valuation ring of a periodic of the periodic absolute value phi P is the subring consisting of all A over B where A and B belong to Z and P does not divide B. Of course, equivalent absolute values have the same valuation ring. They will have the same valuation ring and, and the residue field of IP is uh, 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 Z mod isomorphic to Z mod PZ. So what does the hansel richlich lemma say? Let FX uh, be a polynomial uh, with coefficients in a valuation ring R of a complete non Archimedean valued field K phi. So far, huh? Yes? Pardon? Yes. No, no. It, it was. It was. It, it was. Uh, it, it, the motivation came from number theory. I said before that maybe I can take out that page. No, the main motivation came from number theory to study algebraic number field their properties, but reasoning they used was from analysis. Like. Like Cantor constructed from rationals, Cantor constructed real numbers. You know? So here, uh, here from um, from the field elements, we constructed its completion. Gorshak construct, constructed its completion, and Ostrowski led it further and classified them. And what are the absolute values? What are the absolute values defined? Uh, 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 complete uh, uh, absolute values, which are Archimedean, Archimedean absolute values. They are only reals and complexes. They are only real and complex. This lemma is the key lemma. Tells you how to approximate. See, your mod theory is so end. Limit of solution. So power theory, how do you get that? I was just going to ask whether the Hensel Richlich lemma is also powerful. That Hensel lemma is very powerful. Uh, this is uh, I am going to tell you there are more than a dozen equivalent versions and uh, and uh, of Hensel's lemma that was in the year 1985. Now several other versions have been added. Uh, uh, and several other versions have been added. So uh, since I am restricting myself to elementary base. 
historical absolute values. Absolute values have now been generalized uh, in a very uh, um, uh, powerful setting. I won't come to that. I, I'll only point out in the end. So, 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 uh, uh, so, uh, classical hands. Uh, so, Hansel Richling Lemma. Uh, where is it? No, no. Come back. Come back. So here it is. Let fx be a polynomial with coefficients in the valuation ring R of a complete non-Archimedean valued field K phi. Okay. So this is a complete field. And so phi is a absolute value defined on it. Non-Archimedean means phi of a plus b is less than equal to maximum phi of a, phi of b. If this a naught belong to R, say so that phi of f of a naught is less than equal to epsilon. And how much epsilon is less than phi of you take the derivative, square of that, you put the square outside or inside, doesn't matter because phi of a b is phi of a, phi of b. So then there is this a root a belonging to r of fx. From an approximate root, you get an exact root. So that phi of a minus a naught, that root stays very close to the approximate root is less than so much. And what was classical Hansel's lemma in that time? Uh, uh, in the special case when k is qp, I have not said what is qp. qp, we have q, we have the periodic valuation, periodic absolute value phi p on it, and now that gives rise to a metric on it, and we can complete it. Complete. We, every metric space can be completed, so we complete it, and the completion is called the field of periodic numbers. And of course, one can prove that uh, uh, qp consists of all uh, Lorentz series in P with coefficients, Lorentz series in P uh, with coefficients lying between 0 to P minus 1, 0 and P minus 1 included. So, so, so there is, that's one way to look at QP, okay, uh, with the periodic absolute value uh, uh, and, uh, and the valuation ring denoted by ZP means those which are power series in P, uh, we obtain uh, classical hands, uh, uh, let Fx belong to ZPX be a polynomial. There it was in R, the valuation ring was R, now it is ZP. If there is this A0 belong to Z such that f of A0 is going to 0 mod P, f of A0 is congruent to 0 mod P and f dash of A0 is not congruent to 0 mod P, then there is this a root A belong to ZP of fx such that A0 is congruent to A mod P. Huh? No, uh, uh, something is a root of fx means f of a is exactly zero. f of a is exactly zero. No, that is a very weak condition. Pardon? X is a variable. Uh, no, x is a variable. X is a variable. It's a, uh, the polynomial is in the variable x. The polynomial is in the variable x. F, the polynomial f, fx, has its coefficients in periodic integers. You can think it has coefficients in z for one minute. The completion of z with respect to the periodic absolute value is zp. Okay, for analysis, the completion of Z with No, no, it's, it's not saying A naught is common to A mod P. That doesn't mean that that A naught is A. What does A mod P mean? In 1999, my student Jenti Saha also formulated a version of Hansen's lemma. She needed one. She formulated a more difficult looking version. So, uh, so in 2013, another student, Sanjeev Kumar, formulated another more difficult version of We needed it. For some purposes, we wanted to prove some generalization of a theorem of Ohr. <laughs> I don't 
No, no. I, I want to tell you the greatest significance. From a local zero, you have found a global zero. This is a local zero. A naught is a local zero. It's a, it's, it's a zero in uh, Z mod PZ. It's a local zero. Uh, and from a local zero, you have obtained a global zero. What a big thing. Are there cases where that's not true? Yes, there are cases, and this is sufficient. This is a necessary sort of sort of. Uh, you, you have to assume some condition that f dash is only is a non-repeated local zero. It's a non-repeated local zero. F dash of a naught is not congruent to zero, but it is a non-repeated local zero. From a non-repeated local zero, you are construct getting a global zero. That's a great achievement. That's a great achievement. Uh, I, I will tell you examples where you cannot construct the zero, but but you can immediately prove its existence. You can construct a, uh, um, a local zero, but you cannot construct a global zero. It's not obvious how to construct it. It will take us one hour to construct it. Uh, so uh, in uh, in 1999, uh, she formulated a version of Hensel's lemma, and in 2013, Sanjeev Kumar, another student, in his thesis also. We needed it. We, we needed to create that. It was necessity is the mother of invention. We needed to create that, that particular version. And in 2016, another student, uh, it appeared in Manuscript of Math this year. Actually, it was proved in 2015, but it appeared in Manuscript of Math. Another reformulation of Hensel's lemma and theorem of index of OR. That is the title of the paper. So we needed to generalize theorem of OR to somewhere, something. So, 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 and of course, she also applied, that was not the main aim, she also applied this new version of Hensel's lemma to obtain certain irreducibility criteria for polynomials with coefficients in valued fields. So that, that was not the main aim. Main aim was to prove the theorem. But I didn't, I didn't want you to scare non-mathematicians with so many theorems. So, so, uh, consider the year, uh, we are in the, development of valuation theory and Hase, as uh, uh, um, uh, my predecessors pointed out, was a great collaborator of uh, uh, Imenoider. So, so consider the year 1920, and in that year, Helmut Hase uh, was a young student of 22. He decided to leave his home, University of Göttingen, though Göttingen was a great center for learning, uh, in order to go to Marburg to Hensel's place and continue his studies with Hensel, studying valuation theory and periodics. As pointed out by Hasse in his in the foreword to his collected papers, the motivation for going to Marburg was Hensel's book, Zalan Theory, Number Theory, Zalan Number, so Number Theory. Hasse registered at Marburg University in 1920. Already at the end of this month, in May 1920, Hansel suggested to him a subject for his doctoral thesis, and the title was Quadratic Forms over Q. Q means rationals, and QP is the completion of rationals with respect to the periodic absolute value. So in May 1921, one year after his moving to Marburg, Hase had completed his thesis. I want to tell it to all research students. Hase had completed his thesis and proved the famous local global principle. Now what is local global principle? The principle states that a rational number A is representable by a quadratic form. Quadratic mean, form means form of degree two in variables x1, x2 up to xn with coefficients in rationals over the field of rationals if and only if it is representable by f over the all the PID completions qp for all primes p and over r. r we know is the completion of q with respect to the usual absolute value so so it is it is it is uh, f of x1 x2 up to x and represents a number a rational number a rationally if and only if it represents it over periodics and over the completion of q with respect to the usual absolute value so it may be pointed out that local global principle does not hold for higher degree forms. In uh, 1951, Selmer showed that the form 3x cubed, this is a form of degree 3, 4x uh, uh, to the y to the power 5, 5, has no non-trivial zeros in every, in has non-trivial zeros, means it represents 0 uh, in every completion of q, uh, but 
but uh, and over reals also, but not in Q. So after his thesis, Hase published in Q succession six other papers elaborating on local global principle. In the first of these, he developed a local global principle for the equivalence of quadratic forms with rational coefficients. Uh, given two quadratic forms with coefficients in Q, Hase proved that they are equivalent over Q. So two forms are equivalent over Q. Means the, the, the matrices are, every quadratic form corresponds to a matrix, symmetry matrix. The matrices are equivalent over Q if and only if they are equivalent over the periodics and they are equivalent over R. Pardon? Uh, a local global principle is not same as this result. Local global principle, the f of x1, x2 up to xn is a quadratic form. So a quadratic form is something which looks like over rationals. No. It, it looks like summation aij, xi, xj. Okay? AIJs are rational numbers. Of course, uh, uh, it is equivalent means you can make a matrix because your characteristic is not two. You can you can switch it over to a diagonal form also. It's equivalent to a diagonal form. It represents the same numbers as the diagonal form. So you can take it to a diagonal form as well. Okay. So it local global principle says that this form represents a number a. This form represents a number a means for some 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 for some uh, 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 rational numbers. Ci, this is equal to A, if and only if this same form represents A. Now, now your the corresponding to Ci, you you should have elements from one way round. Of course, it is trivial. If it represents A rationally, then it represents A over reals as well as over every periodics. Okay, or it is the other way round. Global means uh, now if if for every p you find you, you you find elements cip uh, elements c1 p c2 p c n p so that this is equal to then you have you find you can find some ci's so that and those CIs CI should belong to CIs should belong to rational numbers. So, uh, and and to deal with the local case is very very simple. I I, I cannot give you the uh, the uh, I can go into those details because he proved that every non-singular quadratic form in n greater than equal to five variables always represents uh, uh, all numbers always represents all numbers so 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 it's much more difficult to deal with the global problem so Hase proved that they are equivalent over q two quadratic forms if and only they are equivalent over qp and over reals so let us briefly mention that Hasse's local global principle has turned out to be of importance far beyond application to quadratic forms over uh, rationals and over finite extension of rationals. Given a field K equipped with a set capital V of valuations and any field theoretic statement A over K, one can ask whether the following is true, uh, whether the following is true, A holds over K if and only if A holds over KP for all primes P belonging to the set B. Uh, in 1924, Hase uh, 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 proved this another more another more significant result. He generalized his local global principle from Q to all algebraic number fields. So. An important example of the validity of this principle is the Hasse norm theorem proved by Hasse in 1931. Its special cases were proved by Hilbert and Furtwängler, so I put every name. And this theorem was very crucial in the completion of one chapter of my thesis long time back. I will not tell you when my, I wrote my thesis, otherwise you will know my age. <laughs> so, so let L over K be a cyclic extension of number fields for a prime curly P of K 
Prime means uh, you understand. Uh, uh, you can say it's a prime ideal of O k. It's a prime ideal of the ring of algebraic integers of k. Let k p denote the completion of k at p, and L p denote the completion of L with respect to a prime curly p of L lying over p. If a non-zero element of k is a local norm, means it's norm with respect to every completion, then it's a norm, global norm. If something is a local norm for all completions, then it's a global norm. So, so Iminoy, there is great power towards abstraction. During the late 1920s and the early 1930s, there was growing awareness that the theory of non-commutative algebras could be used to obtain essential information about arithmetic structure of algebraic number fields. Because, because till now we were talking only about commutative, and it was she who brought forth this view. This view was forcibly and repeatedly brought forward by enemy Neuther. Huh? So again, I don't, I don't know anything about. Uh, uh, so, so she. Uh, uh, we will come to it. Uh, uh, we will come to it. We are coming to it. Uh, uh, we, will, we are coming to it. We are coming to non-commutative things also. Uh, so, as written by Van der Waarden, uh, one of the uh, uh, what is it? Uh, one of the persons who's, uh, who uh, was mentored by Emil Neuder, in the words of uh, Van der Waarden. Uh, the influence of Imi Neuther on Hasse as well as on others was based on her ability to formulate their problems in abstract form, which in her opinions clarified the uh, uh, situation. Uh, she did not solve mathematical problems, I mean, she didn't solve all mathematical problems uh, herself, but she led the way to the solution by putting them on the abstract track, which in her opinion would lead to the solution by simplification, unquote. So, so the, the, these, um, the, this paragraph was written, uh, something similar was said by uh, him also in the opening remarks. Just as Imi Neither showed that a dedicated ring can be treated by means of its localizations. Okay. So uh, it was proved that in the non-commutative case, now here comes a partial answer to your question. The arithmetic of a maximal order can be similarly described by its localizations with respect to the prime ideals of the, the center of that uh, maximal order. Maximal order occurs in non-commutative rings. So moreover, by including the infinite prime uh, belonging to the Archimedean valuations, it was feasible to proceed much further towards non-commutative foundation of commutative number theory following the desideratum of Eminor. Uh, thus, once more, it turned out that uh, uh, thus once more, it turned out that valuation theory provides for useful and adequate methods to deal with questions of higher algebraic number theory. As an example, let us cite Imi Neuther in a postcard written to Hasse on June 25, 1930. These these postcards uh, are in in the uh, uh, a legacy uh, uh, of the University Library of Göttingen. So the quote has been taken from there. You are, uh, in the exact words of Imi Neuther, they were all written in German. Your hyper complex PIDX has given me much pleasure. Dash, 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 dash. So next. Uh, uh, So on December 29, 1931, Kurt Ansel, the mathematician who had discovered periodic numbers and who is called father of valuation theory, his 70th birthday was celebrated. On this occasion, a special volume of Kirillis Journal was dedicated to him. He had been the, uh, the uh, editor of Kirillis Journal for 30 long years. And at that time when he was 70 years old, he was also the editor. So uh, the dedication volume contains the paper authored jointly by Richard Brauer, Helmut Hasse, and Imi Neuther with the title, Proof of a Main Theorem in the Theory of Algebras. So th this, is, this deals with non-commutative things. Okay? The main theorem allows a complete classification of division algebras over a number field. 
uh, leading to the structure of broad group of an algebraic number field. So I can't define all these terminologies, otherwise I'll get into Hessel's. So broad hasse noether theorem, that's the main theorem. So every central division algebra over an algebraic number field is cyclic. So what is cyclic for mathematicians I can recall. Let L over K be a cyclic field extension of degree N and sigma denote a generator of its Galois group G. Given any A in the multiplicative group K cross of K, consider the K algebra generated by L and some uh, 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 element U with the defining relations U to the power N equal to A, Z U equal to U, Z sigma, Z belong to L. This is a central simple algebra of dimension, non-commutative, of dimension N square over K and is called cyclic algebra. The, the field L is a maximal commutative subalgebra of L over K sigma A. When Artin heard of the main, uh, 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 when Artin heard of the proof of the main theorem, he wrote, the main theorem of course was proved jointly by Brauer, Hasse and Eminoider. Uh, you cannot imagine however so pleased I was about the proof, finally successful for the cyclic systems. This is the greatest advancement in number theory of last years. So my heart felt congratulations for your proof. He wrote to the three authors. So next slide. In November 1932, as uh, Logan Nigam pointed out, Neither delivered a plenary address uh, uh, and he, he didn't mention the title of the address. That may not be of much interest to non-mathematicians, but it's of interest to us mathematicians. Hyper-complex systems in the relation to commutative algebra and to number theory. In, at the International Congress of Mathematicians in Zurich, the Congress was attended by 800 people including Neuther's colleague Herman Boyle, mentioned by Professor Mukanda, Edmund Lando, and Wolfgang Krull. And I will mention something about who Krull was. Krull was also mentored by, by, by uh, Emi Neuther. So, so a glimpse of Krull valuation. And Krull was the one who further took valuations to, uh, uh, to more abstract uh, uh, thing to deal uh, with algebraic geometry. So for a non-Archimedean absolute value, Ostrowski introduced additive notion of valuation by defining, now, now it is, this kind of function is called evaluation, v of a equal to minus log phi of a. Then the mapping v from k to r union infinity satisfies v of a equal to infinity if and only if, sorry, there's a misprint, it should be a equal to zero, a equal to zero. V of A B equal to V of A plus V of B and uh, V of A plus B is greater than equal to minimum of V A and V B because we had phi of A plus B is less than equal to maximum of phi A and phi B. So that translates into this. So V of A is minus log phi of A. Remark, two real valuations are, such a valuation is called a classical or a real valuation. In the beginning of the lecture I said, modern day mathematicians deserve the value, uh, term valuation for a function satisfying these three properties. Those kind of things which were introduced by uh, Kushak, they are called absolute values because they, are, they behave more like absolute values. They don't behave like Euclid's, uh, uh, um, uh, the power of a, exact power of a prime occurring in the factorization of a prime number. So two real valuations are said to be equivalent if they stay real number rho, so that v dash of a equal to rho is a mistake. This is a positive real number rho. Positive real number rho because we said two absolute values are equivalent if phi 1 of a equal to phi of a to the power r with r positive. So it should be rho should be positive. That rho is just that number r. So, so remark, uh, let k be a field. There is a natural one-to-one -one correspondence between the set of equivalence classes of real valuations of k and the set of equivalence classes of non-Archimedean absolute values of k given by the Archimedean values stay apart. They can't be put in this category. So given by v goes to phi, where phi is e to the power minus v, phi goes to v, where v is minus log e phi. Now, in 1932, Wolfgang Krull gave a more general universal definition of valuation as follows. A mapping V from a field K to G union infinity. Now, R union infinity has been replaced by 
you are in infinity. Mathematicians are never satisfied, unfortunately. They are very different from physicists. They keep on proceeding, they always keep on, they let their imagination to the skies. So, G, where G is a totally ordered, additively written abelian group, like R. And, and, the, and the ordering on G is compatible with the addition. It's got, if it satisfies, same properties. Three properties. What, are, what were those three properties? Uh, v of a equal to infinity, if and only if a equal to zero, v of a b equal to v of a plus v of b, and v of a plus b is greater than equal to minimum of v and v b. And we go ahead, and I will not give an example of a, uh, um, similarly for all those a belong to k for which the valuation is non-negative, this is called the valuation ring of K, and it has a, uh, this ring has got a unique maximal ideal. I won't go into that, and I will not give into an example of a uh, 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 immunoider and cruel valuations. So several ideas used in the results regarding cruel valuations are inspired by ring theoretic viewpoint given by Amy Noether. Doering and Krull were stimulated by her and gave an elegant proof for the existence of arbitrary Krull valuations which are centered at a given prime ideal of a given domain. So she worked closely with Krull, who greatly advanced commutative algebra with his hopped ideal zarts. Hopped ideal zarts is the in these days it is called principal ideal theorem. And it says if R is a Noetherian ring, Mm -hmm. Ravi Roy is going to talk about Noetherian rings. They are named after Iminoider. I'm not going to say anything. Uh, if R is a Noetherian ring and I is a principal uh, proper ideal of R, then I has height at most one. And is dimension theory for commutative rings. So, uh, Herman Weil, while delivering a speech, at the funeral ceremony of Immunoider in the house of President Park and Barry and Moore, in which as professor, as he pointed out, she spent her last two years here in the city on April in Pennsylvania, on April 17, 1935, said, uh, quote, this is Herman Weiss writing, justifiably proud for you were a great woman mathematician. I have no reservations in calling you the greatest that history has known. Your work has changed the way we look at algebra, and with your many Gothic letters, you have left your name written indelibly across its pages. No one, perhaps, contributed as much as you towards remolding the axiomatic approach into a powerful research instrument. Instead of a mere aid in logical illustration of the foundations of mathematics as it had previously been. Among us, your predecessors in algebra and number theory, it was probably Dedekind who came closest, unquote. So this is a half a paragraph in the obituary written by Herman Boyle. In his memorial address, Russian mathematician Alexandrov, uh, 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 based at Moscow State University, named Iminoider the greatest math woman mathematician of all time. On her death, Albert Einstein, wrote a letter to the New York Times, which was published on May 5, 1935, with the heading, Professor Einstein writes, in appreciation of a fellow mathematician, quote, in the judgment of the most competent living mathematician, mathematicians, Fraulein Neuther was the most significant creative mathematical genius thus far produced since the higher education of women began. In the realm of algebra in which the most gifted mathematicians have been uh, uh, busy for centuries, she discovered methods which have proved of enormous importance in the development of present day younger generation of mathematicians." Unquote. So, uh, uh, Iminoider and Hermann Weyl, uh, this is I suppose Iminoider and Hermann Weyl next to her. Uh, uh, among a group of mathematicians, and I suppose this is during the Gottingen days, uh, uh, the most productive period of Iminoider life. This is somewhere uh, in Germany. This is I, I I photographed it 
looked in the dictionary, this is the name of a hotel. So somewhere, this means a hotel. And somewhere, this is with the fellow mathematicians. Uh, these are the books I consulted, I referred. And Hassel's papers, and Rishlik's original paper, and and Ribbon Boehm's article containing more than a dozen equivalent forms of Hensel Levan, 1985, and uh, uh, my students generalized Hensel's lemma, which appeared in Proceedings the Edinburgh Mass Society. Then Peter Rocket, History of Valuation Theory One, from where I got. Uh, uh, some of the letters um, and uh, th this is another this paper contains another generalization with Sanjeev Kumar and Rocket when wrote, Rocket wrote this book he sent me as a gift and I also uh, uh, took help from this book Rocket's book and this is uh, uh, the newest version of Hansel's, uh, some, some, according to our need, we have found some other version of Hansel's lemma, reformulation and extension of a theorem of Ohr, uh, manuscript of math, it appeared 2016. Uh, no, no, now it is published, now it is published, now it is not online, now it is published, I forgot to add the reference page number and all. So, and finally, thank you for your patience. Yes. Pardon? The connection of the to the whole thing. The last part No. She posed the right question. She, she in the um, uh, 1918 paper, which which was published in 1980, but uh, uh, but Ostrowski had sent uh, her that in 1916. And there was a page which showed that uh, um, that she wrote uh, 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 in a postcard, wrote, uh, um, which when 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 uh, when Ostrowski sent him that paper, hmm. uh, uh, then she posed a question: which fields can be embedded into real numbers? So that was the year 1900. 18. So we find her connection with valuation theory in 1918. First, and then of course she wrote using valuation theory. She wrote that paper which, which I mean, which Artin had said is the uh, most wonderful contribution to number theory with Richard Brower and Hasse. And then she guided Krull and uh, uh, like. Like she, she defined dedicated rings. He will talk about dedicated rings. I left some significant and easy things, uh, easy for others to understand, uh, for him also, so that he can also reach out the audience. Uh, so, so he will talk about, and he will talk about Noetherian rings, rings which are named after her, Noether. So, so he he is going to talk about many interesting One things. Yes. Today we, when we were young. It was capital N for Noether. Now it is smaller. Small m. Small n. Ha. Become bigger. Ha. Becomes bigger and the name becomes small. <laughs> no longer major in capital, but n small. I have, a, I have a very general question, not mathematics. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, have a, I have heard very few human mathematicians, <laughs> uh, like I mean, Noyer. I'm mm. wondering how the present scenario. You as a professor. How are youngsters taking? Are young, young ladies taking up to careers in mathematics? Yes. Uh, you are the professor. Yes. Times have changed now. Yeah. When I joined, I get your question. When I joined Punjab University, uh, there was only one lady professor out of 32 faculty members. There were they were all gents. And when I joined research, um, Professor Bamba, uh, one of the eminent world-renowned mathematician, uh, he told me. Are you sure you will remain in research? Because girls joined research, they got married, their parents were worried, so they, they're getting over age or whatever, or, and they got married and they left PhD. So he asked me, are you sure you are going to continue with PhD? I said, yes. I said, okay, then you continue with it. Then I was the second faculty member uh, uh, inducted uh, uh, in 1978. 
So I was the second faculty member. And now more than 50% is uh, females and less than uh, the males are less in number. And similar is the case with the research students. There are only, there is only one or two boys and 10 girls in the, that department. Uh, uh, where I studied in Punjab University, Chandigarh. So things are changing now. It, it may be just that some seats have to be reserved for boys to attract them to do PhD in mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember a couple of my girl students here uh, uh, wanted to pursue a career in mathematics. But uh, they were not interested in the mathematics. But I cautioned them saying that, I, I cautioned them saying this, uh, this seems to be more like a field for men. And uh, you were saying... Oh, you, you are too old. You are too old in yeah. your ideas. But, uh, I'm you sorry. Me, <laughs> I, I was hesitant because I don't know. Because I, it looks like the field is dominated by... Um, no, no. Okay. no. So from you, what do you say? It's not no. true. Uh, very nice. Good to hear that. Good yes. To hear that. Yes. Even in ICER also. Equal, uh, there are 50-50. Number is 50-50. Even in ICER Mohali, the number is 50-50. Uh, Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research. That's great news media. So I don't go back and tell Neither was without a salary in Germany. Sorry? Neither was without a salary in Germany till the age of 40. Ah, that's great motivation. And even at that time, it was due to Quran's effort that she got a salary between 200 and 400 marks. And that had to be every year the ministry had to be asked whether they can do it. So even an advanced country like Germany, women were supposed to, well, not work. That's something. So times are changing. And times have in India have cha changed with the rapid speed. So soon I caution the boys into against taking a career in mathematics. Uh, no. <laughs>